Um, but because I've been kind of soaking in Daniel a little bit, I got strange ideas about Daniel. So this may not even really technically fit for an overview of Daniel. And we may do it again in two weeks. But this is just kind of some cr crazy, but scripture integrated, I hope, thoughts about Daniel. I told him it's, it's unconventional. It, it was actually inspired by Daniel and by a Super Bowl commercial. <laughs> And by something I heard in the men's fraternity, a group of men meet on Saturday mornings and on Mondays to talk about ways to disciple each other and to hold each other accountable and that sort of thing. So um, let me just start with the, that uh, thing from the men's fraternity just a little bit here. Um, because whenever you look at two people's lives in scripture, uh, you get kind of blown away by how much integrity they have. And the reason you get blown away by how much integrity they have is because they seem so Christ-like. It just, you it have a hard time finding any moral flaws in them. Believe it or not, this is very unusual in Scripture because Scripture is brutally honest about all of us being born in sin. Daniel was born a sinner too, and I'm sure there was sin in his life as well. And the other is this young man, Joseph, back in the book of Genesis. And he may have boasted a little bit about his coat, but all in all, throughout his life, he just seemed to lean into God in the good times and the bad and brought blessing even to people who were meaning things for his harm. And Daniel, likewise, was taken as a youth into captivity and kind of brainwashed in paganism. And yet he comes out uh, just being a great witness to a lot of different kings in a lot of life-defying kinds of contexts. Um, so... When I think about a character study in a life of those two people in particular, I'm just reminded they aren't Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is the one that has real moral purity all the way down and all the way up and all the way out. And, um, but they're reflecting him by the power of the Holy Spirit by their trust in the living, living God. But sometimes... Uh, I think that we can have an inflated view of ourselves. I know I can have an inflated view of myself. And what it does is it, it, it makes us think that because we think that we're better than average or we're better than Joe College or Joe Sixpack or... You're, oh, that's a given. If you're Joe Me, you're definitely better. But, but, you know, we try to grade on the curve this kind of thing. And I was reminded by something in the men's fraternity that kind of gave me a chuckle. Um, because things aren't always what they seem to be. Uh, we're pretty sure we're doing pretty good uh, until we get into the Word of God. <laughs> and then we realize, oh, He is so holy, and we are so not. Um, and so what we think we are, what seems to be, or what we're pretty sure about, uh, rapidly becomes not so sure. So according to this illustration from the men's fraternity, uh, they gave a math test to a bunch of students from a wide section of different countries across the world uh, a few years back. And um, at the end of the math test, they asked the people the question, um, do you feel you're pretty good at math? And they'd write down whatever their answer was to that question because these are you know, math students taking a math test with an international group and you feel you're pretty good at math. And there were some, there were some interesting surprises in the results of the math test and in how they felt they were at math. So the, um, the, the math students from the USA, over 60% of them said that they, they felt they were pretty good at math. Um, but when the test results came back, they were dead last on this particular exam at this particular time. They, they came in last place, but 60% of them thought they're pretty, pretty good at math. And I'm sure every last one of them was better at math than me. But anyway, the Koreans, on the other hand, less than 30% thought that they were good at math. Um, less than 30% thought they were good at math. And the Koreans came in number one. <laughs> They got the highest on this particular exam at this particular time, the Korean math exam takers. So what it shows us is that our feelings can be out of sync with reality. And what we're sure of when we measure it to a different standard gives us different results. And we need to be 
seeking our standard and our information from the Word of God, and that's why we're so glad for the forgiveness of sins, why we're so glad that we have His imputed righteousness by faith, why we need fresh filling from the Holy Spirit, and so forth. Now, at this time, if you don't mind, Brian, I don't mind narrating this a video from the Super Bowl that we don't have sound for. I think you'll get a kick out of it. It's, it's pretty funny. Maybe you saw that, and you'll get a laugh out of it. Maybe not, but... Uh, I can narrate it if you bring. Okay, is that going to take a little while? Okay, give it a shot. And I'll go on and make some more for more uh, points about this thing. So I find that this is true not just about reality and how we test reality, but about our feelings. So if I am feeling at peace and joyful and I'm feeling all lovey-dovey and I feel like I'm filled with the Spirit and I feel joyful and glad, there's no guarantee that because I feel good that I will do good. <laughs> um, because I can feel good and be blindsided by my own self-absorption and my own entitlement. Um, so anyway, oh yeah, here it comes. So we'll, we'll narrate this commercial. Go ahead and start it. Maybe you got sound on it. We'll see. We'll see what Brian's got there. It's better to hear there so if we can. What do you think, Dr. Armstrong? Do we have something? He's going back and forth between. You should see him as kind of like the Wizard of Oz. Okay, no sound yet? Does that mean I should narrate, or are you still looking for a lever for sound? Uh, that sounds like an attempt for sound. <laughs> Have you seen this commercial? Do you remember this commercial? Okay, it's pretty funny. <laughs> All right, why don't you go ahead and rewind it, Brian? I don't mind narrating it. It's a little bit crazy to do it, but I, I don't mind doing it. We can give up on the sound. We'll start from the beginning. Okay, so Rocket Mortgage. Oh, look, I love this house. This house is definitely the one we want. I'm just so sure. It's got to be pressed play. It seems to be paused, Brian. <laughs> there, there it goes. Press play. There it goes. Oh, yeah, I love it. We're... Is your finances on order? Yeah, we're pretty sure our finances are in order. You get, you're pretty sure. You need to be certain. Uh, you're pretty sure. Pretty sure is not very good. Here's pretty sure. There's a bunch of snakes. I'm pretty sure I got all the snakes out of the thing. And the snake bites him on the face. I'm pretty sure this isn't going to hurt, he tells his wife. And then smack. And I'm pretty sure that thing up on the ceiling is just a figment of our imagination. But it's a really creepy girl. I'm pretty sure we can park in this football player's parking place. Whoops. And I, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that the aliens, they've come in peace. They've got, they've come in, pretty sure. And they, you want to be pretty sure or you want to be certain? They go, yeah, we're going to be we're going to go with certain. So they're going to go with rocket mortgage. And that's pretty much the end of the, end of the commercial. Uh, the difference between being pretty sure and being certain and Daniel is in some positions where he needs to be really sure so we can remove that one Brian that's fine thank you very much I think we got the main point of that now I was at Trinity Life Ministry not long ago and I know you're saying when's he going to get into the Bible but it's kind of a long introduction but uh, at Trinity Life Ministry they had this sheet of paper and I thought it was so good I took a, a photocopy of it and then I realized my inkjet printer is out of ink so it printed it in pink, and I kind of wanted to edit it anyway because it doesn't really read the way I'd like it to read. Um, but I'll share, share this uh, file with you, um, and maybe we have a, a GIF file we can put up on the screen of it. It's about the next time you think that God can't use you to try to remember some things. The next time you think that God can't use you to remember things like this. Noah once got drunk. Uh, Abraham was quite old. Jacob was a liar. Uh, Leah was, well, Scripture says she was ugly. Hi, Karen. <laughs> and uh, Rachel was the one that got all of Jacob's attention. And Joseph was abused by his brothers, right? He was abused. And Moses had a stuttering problem, and he murdered an Egyptian. But God used these people, right? This, the Trinity uh, needs to be reminded of that. I think we need to be reminded of it, too. We're not a Joseph. I'm not a Joseph in the Bible. That guy was amazing. We're not all Daniels. But we are all people that God can use kind of in spite of ourselves. Gideon was afraid. 
Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. I don't know what the long hair's got to do with it, but he was definitely a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. That's was past tense. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David had a horrible affair and covered it up with premeditated murder. Elijah was once suicidal. So was Jonah, by the way. Isaiah once preached naked. Don't worry, folks. No chance of that happening tonight. And Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. Get it? Job went bankrupt. Yeah, he lost everything, right? Uh, Peter denied Christ three times. The disciples fell asleep while praying and fled at Jesus' arrest. Mary Magdalene once had in her resume that she was once possessed by several demons. Uh, the Samaritan woman was divorced several times. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer, and I love this one. And Lazarus was dead. <laughs> So the next time you got an excuse for why God can't use you, remember that some of the people in the Bible that God did in fact use, in addition to Joseph and Daniel, and of course we can do so because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us if we are living our lives to his glory, not our will, but his be done in his timing, in his way, his word in his way. So just some things to think about there by way of introduction. Now, in Daniel chapter 1, a little, just a little tad bit more background, he was exiled in Babylon to Babylon in 605 B.C. This was before the final destruction of the temple, but Nebuchadnezzar and his various conquests of the city, sieges, took out the best and the brightest, the young, the beautiful, the talented, the smart, the ones that passed that math test. And he took them to Babylon to indoctrinate them to be able to control the rest of the people. Because this is the way you control people is using your young, pretty smart, talented people and have them tell you to worship pagan gods and learn the language and, and so forth. So that, that was his intent. Um, when the Persians, the Medo-Persians, conquered Babylon in 539, Daniel was still there. <laughs> and he was older, but he also served under uh, Darius of the Persians. That's just interesting. And in both contexts, including under Belshazzar, not Belteshazzar, that was Nebuchadnezzar's name for Daniel, they're always under very hostile environments. Things that probably, I mean, really were bipolar. <laughs> just scary. One minute they're ready to dress you up and make you second and high of the kingdom, and the next minute they're ready to throw you into the fire or uh, feed you to some, some animals. So, I mean, they're just they're crazy. And Nebuchadnezzar ate grass like an animal under a curse from God. Chapter 1 through 6, God supernaturally rescued Daniel and his friends. And the second half of the book, chapter 7 through 12, is future prophecy. Though future prophecy comes into the early parts too. Um, but one of the things, uh, as you look through chapter 1, and we're going to look through chapter 1 when we start the series after communion next week, is uh, Daniel gets taken into this uh, land in the book of verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came on Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels from the house of the God, uh, the temple. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, that's to Babylon, to the house of his God and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good reputation, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, competent to stand in the king's palace. Um, kind of like a PhD visiting scholars at Purdue or something like that. And to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans, end of verse 4. And the king assigned them a daily portion of the food which the king ate and the wine which he drank, and they were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time they were stand before the king to take the test. Among them are Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, we'll learn what their names mean, Azariah of the tribe of Judah, and the chief eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, uh, Meshach, he, Mishael he called uh, Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Basically taking the names that they had against uh, the named after the God of heaven and naming them after pagan fire gods and fire gods. Change their name, change their language, change their education, change their food, change their, change their clothing. It's a full indoctrination program. We think we're indoctrinated 
and we are. <laughs> but uh, uh, so we need discernment all the time. But this indoctrination was full bore, military force, captive in a, a temple. And so I love verse 8. Of verse 8. But Daniel, but Daniel resolved. Daniel made a commitment. He was a follower of Yahweh, and he resolved that he was not going to defile himself with the king's food or the wine that he drank, and therefore he asked the chief eunuch not to allow him to defile himself, and there becomes a conversation. Um, now, if that would have been me, and I make a resolution, I may have been a little rash. I may have said, I may have started kicking my feet and having a tantrum, right? But uh, Daniel tells him he doesn't want to do this, and the guy says, I'm going to lose my head for you. I mean, <laughs> you're putting my job on the line. I'm going to have to stand before the king, and if you look bad, guess who's going to blame? Me and you. We're all going to die. So Daniel proposes a test to the eunuch that's over them, and the test is just feed us vegetables and uh, test us for 10 days, and if we turn out looking bad, you do what seems best in your eyes to He's really putting out there trusting the Lord on this thing as far as how, how it's going to turn out. Well, I just want to tell you that sometimes in witnessing, and I know we're talking about witnessing here. This is kind of the theme of the message tonight, believe it or not. But God can use us, and we can shine out in a crooked and perverse generation too, and we can bear witness to Christ. And sometimes in witnessing, we think we have to tell everybody our full testimony, or we have to get them all the way through John 3.16, or all the way through the Romans Road, or all the way through the bridge diagram, or all the way through the one verse bridge, or all the way through whatever it is we're trying to get all the way through. And, and sometimes I think uh, offering people a test is not necessarily a bad idea. I don't think that we should fleece God and say, well, God, I'll serve you if you give me a Rolls Royce. You know, that's, that's ridiculous. But um, I had a friend at Purdue University. His name's Daniel Mizell. He's living right now up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And he used to come to the Ratio Christie meetings. I've actually got a video of him, but if we have luck with that video like we did the other one, I can show it to you. If you uh, email me, I'll send it to you. It's on YouTube. But uh, Daniel was a hardcore atheist. And he used to come to the Ratio meetings mainly because he wanted to stump the Christians, Christian chumps. And when he would come, his body language was so out of sorts with the meat. I mean, he would just cross his hands and, you know, impress me. Yeah, that, that don't impress me much. Week after week, he would do this. And his body language would soften a little bit, but he was still kind of, yeah, let me think about this one. And his wife was also an atheist. And, um, well, a student named Paul Kobfleisch, who's right now in Arizona, um, and... Um, cancer survivor, but his cancer's back. Pray for him. Pray for Paul. He's handling it pretty well unto the Lord. But um, Paul was witnessing to him and answering all sorts of questions with him and going into strange places with him uh, to visit and even being insulted by his friends in his academic departments. But Paul was just kind of sharing Christian apologetics with him, sharing the gospel, a little bit of testimony. Not a lot, but hanging in there with him. Over time, Dan Mizell's posture began to share change a little bit, but it was really Dr. Erica Carlson, who's a physics professor at Purdue, that visited the Ratio Christi one meeting one night, and Daniel was there and, and expressed his atheism and his commitment to that. It's really the smart people, and Erica's there, and she's a Christian and, and physics prof, and uh, Erica didn't try to, quote, out-argue him. <laughs> she said, um, Daniel, I, I just want to challenge you to put the Lord to a test. Why don't you just, um, every day for 30 days, just cry out to the universe or to the cosmos or whatever, if there is a God out there, reveal yourself to me. If there is a God out there, reveal. just try it, a test for 30 days. And um, he said, well, he thought he could do that. It sounded kind of, sounded kind of ridiculous, but he'd do it. And uh, so the first day, um, he prayed to the universe, if there's a God out there, reveal yourself to me. And he became a Christian on the very first day with the very first prayer. But he was a little bit freaked out because he thought, what in the world is my wife going to say when I get home? she gets home and I tell her I become a Christian? And um, you can confirm all this. It's an amazing story. He's in a church up in the uh, Upper Peninsula. Um, wife comes home and says, Daniel, I've got something to say. And he says, 
no, no, I, I have something to say first. And they argued about who would be the first to say what they were going to say, but it turns out she became a Christian on the same day through a whole different unique set of circumstances. They both become Christians on the same day. How about that for the sovereignty of God, right? I mean, that's a God thing. That's not a who's the smartest person in the room or who's, uh, who is uh, too tall or too old or too unattractive or too young or had ulcers. Or what. This is, it's a God thing. Just being willing to be used. And Daniel's story has, has touched a lot of a lot of people. Daniel Mizell, after the book of Daniel, probably. I don't know what his parents or family background is that much. But yeah. So anyway, I wanted to show you some uh, icons of a timeline. And I'm guessing I don't have those either, Brian. The the little icons, do they come up? I've shown these to you before. Uh, oh, you found the one of the <laughs> all the people with their dysfunctions. Yeah, there we go. There it is. So I use this all the time for Old Testament history. And I'm just telling you where in the Old Testament timeline the book of Daniel fits in. I already told you the date, but the date's a little bit different in terms of Old Testament history. So the, the Old Testament starts with creation, and then it goes to clan. That's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And then they go into captivity in Egypt, from basically because there's a famine, and they go there for food to survive. And then it turns out Joseph saves Israel and witnesses to Egypt. And But then another pharaoh rises up that doesn't know Joseph and oppresses the Jewish people. And so they go into captivity at the Passover, and the pharaoh's army gets drowned. And now they get the, the covenants, the Ten Commandments, out on Mount Sinai. And they camp for 40 years because they doubted the, the word of the Lord. And then they renew the covenant in the book of Daniel, I mean, excuse me, Deuteronomy, where God says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then they go into the promised land. You can see down the next thing on the conquest there with the sword. That's Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls are coming tumbling down and AI didn't go so well. And then you get the cycle of the judges and you know that cycle, right? Uh, they're in prosperity and everything's fine. So then they go into idolatry, then they get oppressed and then they cry out to God for delivered. God raises up an unlikely judge usually. And then they're happy for a day or two and then they go back right back into sin. This, this cycle repeats itself. till finally you get uh, Samuel anointing um, Saul and then David and Solomon under the United Kingdom of the crown that doesn't have a, cr a thing through the middle of it. And then the chasm, and that's the divided kingdom of Israel to the north, Judah to the south. The first captivity is Assyria. Israel to the north goes in captivity to uh, Assyria. And then Judah in the south goes into captivity. That's the second ball in Shanghai to Babylon, and right towards the end of the Babylonian captivity, we already mentioned, Daniel goes to Medo-Persia, and he gets prophecies about Greece, and he gets prophecies about the, uh, the Romans, and he gets prophecies about when the Messiah will show up, and the actual date, and he actually gets prophecies about the Antichrist, and uh, that one missing week, and, and uh, breaking the covenant in the middle, and, and more on that. But we're going to focus on tonight... Um, so basically at the end of the second captivity, right before the reconstruction under Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, Ezra, Esther's a little bit towards the uh, construction period as well. But we're going to take a little bit more of a look at the last one. But could we put the acrostic up as well? I, I like to do acrostics. This is the one that uses uh, Daniel's faith. Yeah, there it is. And you can tell this is my own scribbling. I took a picture of this on my sofa chair tonight. And if you read down the letters on the right, you'll see Daniel's faith. And what it does is it names every chapter of the 12 chapters of Daniel after this acrostic. And it helps me to keep the content in like a, a closet or a drawer so I can remember these things. Like Daniel wins over Nebuchadnezzar's food in chapter 1, and he interprets the vision, uh, the dream in the, chapter 1, the fiery furnaces in 3. Um, interpretation of the tree vision, that's where Nebuchadnezzar goes nuts and eats like grass. And then uh, Belteshazzar's evil feast, you'll remember that story. That's the meanie, meanie, tickle you farson. Maybe you don't remember that. It's uh, <laughs> the finger that writes on the wall that you're going down, Belshazzar. <laughs> this night, you're going to go. And uh, and then the, the various creatures for the various periods, the 70 weeks there. That's the ninth chapter, count it down. D-A-N-I-E-L. S F A faith is the A point but pointed at seventy weeks, chapter nine, and then on to chapter twelve. And chapter twelve is where we're gonna land tonight. So um 
Go ahead and turn in your Bible. We took a little bit of look at Daniel 1. We're going to take a look at uh, Daniel 12. So this is, uh, have you ever heard the expression, sometimes in sales or planning books, they will tell you, you should begin with the end in view? <laughs> it's just, it's kind of a, it's one of those jargonistic things like team. Together, each one accomplishes more. People don't care what you know until they know how much you care. All these kind of like sloganistic things that there are exceptions to. Uh, but uh, yeah, so beginning with the end of the, in view is kind of important. It's not always the whole thing, but it reminds me of the Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland. Remember the story, Alice goes to Wonderland, she takes the pill, one pill makes you smaller, and one pill makes you large, and the ones that mother gives you don't do anything at all. Go ask Alice. Boom, boom, boom. Jefferson Airplane. No, Jefferson Star. Yeah, Jefferson Air Airplane before the Starship. Anyway, uh, so she goes to Wonderland, and she's a frivolous girl, and she doesn't seem to have a lucid thought in her head. And she sees the Cheshire Cat and, and asks her, can you tell me which way I should walk? And the cat says, that depends on where you go. And, and she says, or where you want to go? And she says, well, it doesn't matter where I go. And the cat says, and it doesn't matter which way you walk. <laughs> so we have to begin with the end in view. We have to know what we're looking for. Are we looking for glorifying Christ who is our Savior and Lord and soon coming King? Are we looking forward to his coming? Are we looking to his word for our guide, guidebook? If we are, it determines how we walk, how we talk, how we live, how we give, how we serve, how we worship. Um, raising kids God's way, how we do education, how we do whatever we do. We do it all to the Lord, glorifying his name. So we're going to begin with the end in view tonight, basically because I'm going to do an introduction to Daniel. Again, that's a little bit different, maybe a little bit the same, but I had to do something tonight as a stand. -alone. So we're in chapter 12 of Daniel, and um, we're going to read the first three verses. And as I mentioned, this is, believe it or not, about witnessing. <laughs> so let's start with verse 1. At that time, what's that time? Well, the last verse says, he shall come to an end with none to help him. It's talking about uh, these uh, political rulers. Personally, I think this one here may be the Antichrist himself. At verse 1 of chapter 12 says, At that time shall arise Michael. We know Michael is the archangel. He shows up elsewhere in the book. The great prince who has charge of your people. Pause who are Daniel's people, Israel, Jewish people. So Michael is watching out over the Jewish people, and he's going to arise. And there shall be a time of trouble such as there has never was from um, Israel being a nation until that time. Let me, let me read it. From my, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. And this is at the time of the end. So it's going to be beyond Hiroshima. It's going to be beyond Nagasaki. It's going to be beyond the Hootsies and the Tutus. It's going to be beyond the American Civil War. It's going to be big time trouble. Sometimes in the Bible, theology students will call this the time of Jacob's trouble. Really the tribulation period. Um, God's wrath's poured out on the earth. There's 144,000 Jewish believers and so forth. But let's carry on reading here. But at that time, Daniel, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Now, at this point, I could start cross-referencing all the references to the book and you have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life and give a salvation message. But this message is not about you becoming a Christian tonight. Though if you're not a Christian, you need to become a Christian tonight. But this is a message about your becoming a witness to salvation to other people and be motivated to do so tonight because of the example of Daniel, because of the scriptures. So um, people can be saved, people can survive, but it's going to be based on whether their name is written in that book. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Oh, I said I wasn't going to talk about the book. Okay, verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake. Pause on that to say this. It's talking about people who have died. 
I've talked about that a little bit today in the Psalm 139 when he said I was knit together in the, the uh, earth. And uh, he didn't really develop this out, but I know it was on his mind. He was probably thinking about it. But apparently all the elements that are in our bodies physically can be found in the earth's crust. And there's a lot of different elements in it because we've eaten a lot of junk food. And our, liver, our livers have taken it all out. And it's all in there. And basically everything that's in the earth's crust is right, right there in us. We were made from dust and we're going to return to dust unless the rapture happens first. And uh, so many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Wait a minute. I didn't think the Old Testament taught uh, everlasting life. It does right here. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, King David said in Psalm 23. But many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt, and some to limbo and some to purgatory and some to a second chance. Uh, you know, I'm adding that, right? Yeah. I better watch out. I'm getting under judgment for that. Revelation says you don't want to add to the word of God. So I'm joking with you here. Basically, there's two fates. Two fates. Um, everlasting life. And John's gospel tells us in Jesus' words how that happens. We commit our trust and reliance on Jesus Christ. Whosoever believes or trusts and relies upon him shall have everlasting life. Period. Not perish, but have everlasting life. And what's the perishing? Well, the perishing is everlasting contempt. It's not a little bit of contempt. It's contempt that lasts a little bit of while. It's Jesus teaching on hell. It's, it's an eternal thing. It's not a pretty thing. It's not something that we laugh about. It's not something that we wish on anybody. It's not something we even particularly like to preach on. But it's in the Word of God. If Jesus teaches it, I'm going to teach it. It's in Daniel. We're going to talk about it. Two fates. Very important. Everybody should know where they're going, but as I said at the beginning of this message, everybody feels pretty good about being above the curve, right? Everybody thinks they're doing the pretty good with the math score, but the other nations are all doing better and we're at the bottom. And the people that are at the top don't realize, I'm actually pretty good at math. No, they think they stink at math, but actually they're the one. <laughs> we're confused. We don't know who we are. We don't know where we're going. We don't know how much we need God and God's word. And eternity is on the line concerning these things. So verse 3 says, And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I know, wow, isn't that, incre isn't that incredible? And and. It's just, and that's actually where we're going to end tonight. I mean, that's, that's our passage we're going to look at, these first three verses. There's so much in there, isn't there? And, and the book of Philippians talks about this as well, that you shine out like stars amongst a crooked and perverse generation. But just, it, it's so powerful, and, and that wow just makes me want to read it again. It just let's read it again. Start with verse, chapter 12, verse 1. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn Many true righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So it's talking about doing the work of an evangelist. And this is actually one of the verses in the pastoral epistles. We're in Titus uh, just a few weeks ago. Tom was preaching through Second Timothy where Paul's last words to Timothy was to preach the word in season, out of season. And one of the things he said was to do the work of an evangelist. That's not to say you have the gift of evangelism. It's just say do the work of evangelism. Share your testimony. Share your faith. Share the gospel. Share your Bible verse. Share, um, and um, God will use it. And that's where I got hit with something this week that was pretty fun. And I want to bless you with some resources tonight. It's a little bit of a training thing. But um, there are some things. I would like you each to take two of these. <laughs> They're just too good. And uh, what they are are little Gospels of John. 
and I, I think there's enough for everybody to get two. And if somebody wants to get three, they can have three. Kim, could you help me pass these out? That'd be wonderful. And uh, Brian, can we get that tracked brochure? Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. And maybe uh, Gary, would you help me with this one? Maybe if everybody would like to, they could take two or three of these. This is another. Now, this Gospel of John, you may not like it because it doesn't have the chapter divisions in it, but it's NIV, and it's the full Gospel of John. You can give that out to somebody, and you don't have to worry, oh, I don't know if I can pass this out because it's a tract, and sometimes tract have weird things in them. Hey, it's the Gospel of John, word for word. This is a little bit different. Why don't you each take two of these? It's a little tract. Um, yeah, just let everybody have two of those. And you may want to keep one for your grandkids to see or something like this. I love this thing. You probably can't see it from where you are, but it's got one of those two-dimensional pictures on it, and it's got the tombstone over the top of Jesus' grave, and then it's got the tombstone rolled away, and uh, Jesus is risen from the dead. Now, the reason I was thinking about this the other day was, again, at Purdue University. Um, are you guys familiar with Mardi Gras and Fat Tuesday and some of this stuff? It's really, it's really interesting. But um, some church traditions will give up things for Lent to, cut, to be humble, to think about the importance of the cross of Christ. Um, and they're very much into the cross, but sometimes not as much into the resurrection. Gary wrote a song. He talked about, oh, my Jesus ain't on the cross no more. <laughs> I ser and, and we used to do a song, uh, Vessels of Mercy, we you know, Gator, and I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. You ask me how I know. My, uh, Leon Russell did it. And I was just seeing all these kids, you know, getting these little ashes things put on their head on Ash Wednesday last week. And they're giving stuff up, and they're sacrificing so much for the Lord, and, and they're, they're trying to be humble and all this. But uh, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is my crucified Savior. He died for my sins. But that was one time in the past. One and done. And, and he conquered death at the resurrection. And he wants to give us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And it's based on the resurrection. So the three verses on the back of the little um, two-dimensional thing there are all about the resurrection. And I think that's helpful for people. It's good news. It's good news that Christ is alive. He has risen. And yeah, you can fast. Absolutely, you can fast. And, and you can witness, but these are tools. Now, people will say to me, Joe, goodness gracious, aren't you in apologetics ministry? Don't you know you can't use a tract in witnessing because tracts will not help anybody become Christians? Well, uh, there's... <laughs> There are some things that are different about that. And by the way, that was a fabulous story this morning about shoveling snow. But anyway, I just was reminded of that by somebody else. Um, so tracks. I will send you the gift of this. I, I'm sure you can't read that, can you? You can't read that at all. All right, so I got one here. I'm going to order some more. We'll get them for you in a bit. Um, but let me just pick a number between 1 and 50. And call it out here, and th that will be reasons on this track. It tells us that you should use tracks. Okay, so pick a number between one and fifty and call it out. Somebody call one out. Fourteen. We're doing fourteen. Did somebody else say forty-five? Okay, fourteen. Tracks are easy to give to another person with a smile and encouragement to read them. Easy to do. Okay, what was the other one? Forty-five. Forty-five is tracks can communicate to a non-reader who asks someone to read it. To them now, two people have read it. There, there's like 50 of these. Some tracks will get read by more than one person. You can share your testimony with somebody at Panera, or at Starbucks, or at Sacred Grounds, and you're sharing it with one person. But if you can give them a tract, a lot of times more than one person will see it and read it. I can tell you a story about when I worked in a shop, Barber Coleman Company in Rockford, Illinois. I used to bring tracks in there. It was an assembly line, but we'd get a break, and I'd share a tract with somebody, and they would take the tract because they wanted to make fun of me, which was really kind of cool. I mean, I didn't think it was cool at the time, but, I mean, it, it kind of worked out for good. So they would read the track, and they'd go, you know what that idiot believes? He believes this, this tract, and they don't want to keep it. 
So they give it to somebody. Well, what does it say? Uh, here, take a look. And that thing would travel through the whole shop. Everybody in the shop would read that track because they wanted to know what the idiot believed. Well, believe it or not, I was using these tracks and I got some Gospels of John. And I started passing those things out too because I thought, well, they're not going to be able to mock me for the whole thing because I can't read the whole thing. And some of them wouldn't keep it and some would give it back. But the head mocker uh, that worked right underneath the foreman uh, read through the... Uh, 21 chapters of John and became a Christian. So the word doesn't come back void. <laughs> and, you know, there a lot of people read it that didn't. A lot of people read it that ridiculed it. A lot of people made fun of it. I remember people used to make fun of me. Oh, well, if there are children listening, you might want to turn off you know, uh, the King James word fornication in the Bible. And they would always use the shorter version of that. You know, the F-bomb. And all the time and particularly to me, to try to get a rise out of me. And I remember saying to one of the guys, he said, you know, you don't even know what that word is. Oh, yeah, I do, every weekend. And it's, it's just CD conversation. I said, no, you don't know what the actual English word is. Yeah, I do, it's right there. It's not, that's not the word. Well, what is it, smarty pants? It's fornication. Well, what does it mean? <laughs> I know what it means. No, you probably don't even know what it means. You know, oh, I know what it means. It's me and my wife and my girlfriend. No, no, it's not what it means. It means having premarital sexual intercourse without being married. That's what fornication is. And then they would talk about that for the whole day. Which church is into fornication and all, all this? But, you know, the, the interesting thing is to show them the verse of what it meant in the King James Bible, or the New King James Bible, or the English Standard Version Bible, uh, you have to show them the verse. And what's the verse? <laughs> well, it's right before the fruit of the Spirit, and which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith. You know the verse. But the paragraph before talks about the deeds of the flesh. And it's got, you know, thievery, lying, and stealing, and all this stuff. And it's got fornication. But the list ends with... And those that practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I don't have to say it. They're looking the verse up because it's that word. They don't know what that word is, but they're using the slang of it all the time. And it's bringing them to the conclusion. And then it's drawing them to the contrast with being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's like, you know, this is divine appointments. It's like, you know, God's word is sharp and it's, it's, it convicts people of sin. So... Two more numbers between 1 and 50. So I'll call off, call off. 37, what have we got for 37? 37 says, tracks never get tired. Evangelists get tired and they have to go to sleep. People passing them out get tired, but the track will keep on working. Another number between 1 and 50. What one? 22. 22 is. Tracks are portable. You can carry them in your purse, your pocket, your planner, your notebook, your laptop. <laughs> tracks never get embarrassed. Um, and sometimes we can be embarrassed to pass out something. Now, we have some more numbers on this. this oh, you got one there. Can you see them there? Oh, look at that. You can actually look at some of those numbers now. Um, but call out another one, and I'll read one to you while you're reading that, and that way you can do double duty. Between 1 and 50, one more number. 40 and 70? No, 7. 7 and 40. Okay, number 7 says, da -da -da -da. tracks work 24 hours a day. Tracks are not expensive. Okay, and the other one is 40. 40 is tracks can cross ethnic and cultural barriers as they get passed on to people group to people group. And up. Okay, now there are also, um, between the number 51 and 88 on this brochure, ways that you can use a tract. Okay, so here's your parameters between 51 and 88. So call out a number between 51 and 88. 70. Tracks can be left in a locker at the gym. Okay? Another one between 51 and 88. Tracks can be left in return library books. Tracks can be given to parking attendants. Tracks can be passed out at parades and festivals. Tracks can be handed out at a stadium before a sporting event. Tracks can be placed in greeting cards. Tracks can be passed out door to door. Um, I mean, there's so many of these things. 74, tracks can be left for the paper and mail carriers. So you just give one to your mail person. 
Trash can be placed in each box of a bag of merchandise that you sell. Oh, and here's some ways not to use tracks. This is number 89 through 100. Don't litter. Read the track before you give it out. You don't want to give people bad information. Don't force tracks on people. Don't be rude. Be polite if they refuse. Say, oh, that's fine. You don't need it. You don't, you don't have to take it, right? But anyway, I just wanted to kind of set you up with the tool. Now, I got to tell you, even with my conversation and my story about Daniel Mizell and my story about working in the shop and my story with the colorful language people in the shop, um, I still have been a little bit reluctant about tracks. But every now and then I will hear a story. <laughs> and what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about those who are wise shall shine out with the brightness of the sky above and those who turn many to righteousness. Nobody gets born righteous. You have to turn, you have to repent to get to right. But somebody has to tell you, hey, there's another way to live. There's another life. There's another way. And some people say, well, should I go in the realm of materialism or should I go in the realm of hedonism and pleasure? Say, uh, That's a false choice. You're just giving me two choices. There's some other choices too. Well, what are some other choices? Well, you can go in the realm of education and thinking that you're going to educate yourself out of it. Or you can become a socialist and redistribute other people's money. Or you can return from yourself and your sin to the living God and get a new life. Uh, there, there's a lot of ways to draw a crooked line, Lecrae says, but there's only one Savior, only one mediator between God and man, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. But this is just kind of intriguing here at the back. This is a quote from Billy Graham. Nothing surpasses a track for sowing the seed of the good news. How about that? Oh, there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go up on that one. There you go. Keep going up. And then the second paragraph is a quote from Charlie Spurgeon. I've been getting some things from uh, Jackson Morgan from Charlie, uh, Charles Spurgeon. When preaching and private talk are not available, you need to have a tract ready. Get good striking tracts or none at all. A touching gospel tract may be the seed of eternal life. Therefore, do not go out without your tracts. Let each one of us, if we have nothing for Christ that we can do, begin to do something now. The distribution of tracts is the first thing. Um, actually, the first thing might be number 100 above. If you can pull down a little bit there, Brian, I think I have to disagree with Charlie on that. Number 100 says, well, you're uh, tied up with something there. It says, don't do tract distribution alone. Seek God's guidance and blessing at every turn. So you don't have to have another person, but ask the Lord to lead you. Pray first. He'll set up the ground. He'll give you the opportunity. But listen to this one. This is really interesting. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the great awakenings that happened um, in history, great revivals, but one of the big-time preachers during that time was a guy named George Whitfield. And did you know that George Whitfield, a preacher in the Great Awakening, was saved by a gospel tract? After reading it, it, he wrote, God showed me I must be born again or be damned. The great missionary to China. Some people think Bill, William Carey was the founder of the modern missionary movement. I really think, of course, it was Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But I think Hudson Taylor may have been the one. Hudson Taylor was also saved by reading a gospel tract. And then Greg Kokel, who works with the Apologetics Ministry, I know he's a great conversationalist. He answers questions with questions. Became a Christian through reading a gospel track. He says, some brave soul put it at the bottom of his grocery bag while checking me out at the grocery store. Isn't that amazing? And I wrote a guy's name up there, Tony Grulet. Tony works with uh, um, Ray Comfort. He's a big fan of track. He does apologetics. He does podcasts. He debates with uh, Muslims. He does all kinds of different ministry. But he always has tracks on him. And that's because he was at a grocery store and saw one of the ways you're not supposed to use tracks, and that is putting it in other people's merchandise. He bought something, the thing was stuck in there, he read it, and became a Christian. I mean, it's just wildness, but those sorts of things happen. But anyway, I guess my point tonight um, with this message is if Daniel could witness to a king that could kill him, witness to a guy that's overseeing him about his diet, witness to another king that... Uh, is drinking out of the utensils from the Lord's temple. Um, praying when Darius tells him not to pray and going into a lion's den. Uh, he wasn't present for his friends. I don't know if he was on a road trip or where he was, but they got thrown in that fiery furnace. But I'll bet they were prayer partners. And if he could live and minister through that kinds of stuff, through that level of indoctrination that we saw in chapter 1, we should be able to take these little steps of faith's obedience 
You about a challenge to a friend? Well, I know you don't believe me, but you ever taken a challenge to maybe pray and ask the cosmos if there's a God out there? Reveal yourself to him. And um, it's worth it's worth the challenge. It's worth the the joy of the Lord is involved in in sharing these things. I just think, goodness gracious, we have this treasure and earth and vessel, the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. We have the Gospel. We have so many tools at our disposal. And I, I hope those just two or three little things that you have tonight, that you might use them strategically. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Daniel. We thank you for the prophecies that are in there. We thank you for motivation of a godly character. And, um, and we know that we are not that godly and that you are a great, godly savior and you are a friend of sinners and you're drawing people to yourself thank you lord that we can be a link in a chain or a cord of love or a wooing that comes from your very throne by the holy spirit of god who has that wonderful fruit to reach people who do not know you or have drifted away from you and have become unproductive and unfruitful we pray lord god that you would Bring people to mind for us that we could share this with. And sometimes, Lord, uh, people who have drifted and are carnal, if they would get involved sharing their faith, they might realize, as Philemon says, every good thing that we have in Christ through the sharing of our faith. I know that passage is talking about fellowship, but Lord, there is something about faith's obedience, taking steps to share that actually fills us with joy, fills us with your spirit, fills us with hope. And then we see answers to prayer. We see people that you're, you're tugging on their heartstrings, and we rejoice, and, and we tell those stories. Father, I thank you so much for the privilege to share these things tonight from the book of Daniel, from the first chapter, and from the last chapter, and from this man's life. And we look forward to going into the book more in depth in the future. We pray that uh, you would dismiss us with your peace and with your presence, and and I am going to say, as everyone's um, eyes are closed, heads bowed, if there are people here that would like special prayer, looking for a job, healing for a friend, struggled situation, and you'd like me to linger a bit afterwards tonight here in the front rows to, to pray with you, I would love to pray with you. Uh, no problem at all. But uh, I want to look for you so I can find you. Because <laughs> if you just come up to talk, I'm just going to think you're just coming up to, to shoot the breeze. But So if anybody would like special prayer, just slip up your arm so I can keep an eye out for you. Okay. All right. Well, you're you're okay. You're in sync with the Lord. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to be in sync with the Lord. And and if you're not, don't leave this place without asking Him to fill your spirit with His Spirit, and help you to do the work of an evangelist, even if you're not an evangelist, with joy, and to show you uh, wonderful things that you are doing behind the scene, and to help you to shine out as a bright light like the stars in the heavens, in the midst of crooked and perverse generation, until you come. And we do look forward to coming, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you that you are a risen Savior. And we thank you that you have all power in heaven and earth. And you are going to crack the sky and slay the armies of the earth. But you're also going to crack the sky and you're going to bring your church into your presence first. And we look forward to that. We know it could happen in any moment. And we're ready. And we say... With the closing verse of the scriptures, even so, come Lord Jesus. We love you tonight because you first loved us. And we thank you that we can sing your praise and be in your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.